to sit down because no one's sitting down in this thing. I'm, I'm just going to do it for a second because I want to see what it's like to sit like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just like being a talk show host. Yeah. Okay, that's enough. Okay. Um, our next uh, speaker um, is Hugh Obrodovich, and he, he already introduced himself this morning. Uh, it's good to put your chair to work. Um, he is the Adeline J. Uh, Physician-in-Chief of the Lucille Salter Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford. Um, he is a, uh, a distinguished chair. He's been a chair for just about two decades. And uh, he spent the last decade, decade here with us, uh, helping us to transform Stanford's effort in, in many areas. Uh, I think one of his legacies will be the Child Health Research Institute, which he directs currently, a uh, tremendous resource, which is one of the institutes here at Stanford that reaches across the entire uh, university. Uh, we all knew Hugh before he was a chair here, not because of his chairmanship at um, Sick Kids in, in uh, um, Toronto, but um, because he was a, a scientist uh, working on the lung. And he was focused on lung development, in particular fluid fluxes in the lung. Uh, when he came here, he became um, increasingly interested in one kind of uh, lung problem, which was bronchial pulmonary dysplasia, a, co a complication associated with preterm birth. Uh, and is really one of the scourges, along with necrotizing or colitis, um, that uh, occupy much of our time uh, with babies who are born um, too early and are in the, uh, in the nurseries. So Hugh's going to talk to us uh, uh, this afternoon about some of the work that he's been doing here. Um, and um, I think it also points out some, some interesting approaches to a very complex problem again. Um, the slam dunks in biology are probably over, and it requires not only transdisciplinary efforts, but also... Um, really complex um, understanding with the help of computational scientists to get at um, some of the things we're now looking at. So Hugh, you may come out now and address us. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> Thanks very much, David. So I was a very young pediatric pulmonologist uh, when she walked into my office. And it was this young mother who... Uh, young baby I'd been taking care of with bronchopulmonary dysplasia and the child had just died. And she came to me and wanted to express her thanks to me, the rest of the healthcare team, for all that we had provided for her child. Well, for me, this was one of the most humbling experiences in my life. I mean, how could this mother come to me and thank me when I couldn't save her child's life. I also felt very inadequate because I could not explain to her, or for that matter, to my pulmonary fellows, why would this little premature baby be born? And despite us giving this baby the best possible nutrition, oxygen support, nursing care, that the organs didn't develop properly. As the body grew and needed bigger and stronger lungs with better blood vessels, they failed to develop. And so really, it was this patient and several other patients which really led me as a pediatric pulmonologist to focus my career on newborn lung disease and its sequelae, such as bronchopulmonary dysplasia. <coughs> Excuse me. So today, I'm going to take you on a little journey of history, uh, I'll show you a couple more of my patients, and I'll end up at hopefully sharing with you some exciting uh, work that we've done here at Stanford using this transdisciplinary approach going across multiple schools and what this exciting environment can prevent. Okay, so bronchopulmonary dysplasia is a very frequent sequelae of the very uh, prematurely born infant. Um, I'm going to give you a little brief history and also some long-term outcome for these children. I'm going to also talk about the incidence and mechanisms. And then I'm going to end up with talking about some genetic predispositions to bronchopulmonary dysplasia. In other words, inherent genetic predispositions. This is a picture from the 1960s um, when the second uh, so child of John F. Kennedy was born. Actually, and this child was prematurely, by cesarean section, 
but it was at 34 and a half weeks. At that time, it was thought to be very premature. Nowadays, that's... <laughs> Wow, <laughs> big baby. Had a birth weight of four pounds. Now, the problem was that this baby died very shortly thereafter from an acute respiratory distress syndrome. This actually was an important sentinel event. It helped the government focus and create what is now known as the NICHD, uh, previously led by Ellen Guttmacher, to sort of look at what are the causes and etiology of respiratory distress syndrome in this age group. So this was really quite profound in 1960s this size of a baby, just a few weeks early, could not survive. So, jumping a little bit ahead, now 1970s, this is one of my patients, when I was a resident, who was born 28 weeks gestational age, size was appropriate, and had a neonatal RDS, and now because we had ventilators and we had oxygen, we could save this child's life. So this premature baby, who was born around 30 weeks of gestation, ended up having actually quite a successful life. In fact, I met her when I was giving a lecture uh, many years later after having graduated from school. And with this degree of prematurity where we could intervene at this time, what happens was that there was really little or no pulmonary sequelae, and there's been studies done. This happened to be one from the hospital for sick children. But basically, if you were able to survive this acute episode, you were doing fine. After that, what happened was we learned how to ventilate babies for weeks, and we actually didn't give up on them, we rather ventilated for weeks. And again, some would live, some would die, and then as we continued to ventilate them, some would recover and be normal, and then some developed this disorder called bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And I have the little Stanford logo because it was Bill Northway, an observant radiologist here at Stanford, who initially described this bronchopulmonary dysplasia, in other words, abnormalities in the airways, in the lung parenchyma itself, and that it had a look of dysplasia, and this was because at that time we used too strong of ventilators and we used too much oxygen. And basically, oops, sorry, it had this kind of effect. This is another uh, couple of my patients. I love showing this picture because these are twins. The first twin, shown over here, had neonatal RDS, the one that you quickly survive and recover from in a few days. His other twin is shown right next door, at home. And you'll notice this is after discharge, they're quite old, and he's still got an oxygen cannula in his nose, having to breathe. The second thing is that this is a graphic illustration at that time of the profound effect of this lung disease on the rest of the body and how it would grow. So bronchopulmonary dysplasia, this newly identified disorder, was having good news, we could survive and we could save a lot of them, but bad news had tremendous long-term outcome. Now, what was happening in this baby? Sorry. Um, pathologists have, have studied this, and I've quoted here a study from Europe. Basically, in this one here, they looked at the alveolar number. Alveoli are the little air sacs in your lung. And basically, these are all children who had died accidentally in traffic accidents or something similar. And so this basically says that in the control group at different ages, that you had between 200 and 300 million alveoli. But when these pathologists carefully looked at how many alveoli of these children who had died again, suddenly and unexpectedly, but had had bronchopulmonary dysplasia, you can see this profound reduction in the total number of alveoli, or air sacs, which they could breathe. The graph on the right is just, you can measure surface area, but it tells you the same way. The way that I like to graphically show this to uh, both scientists and the lay public is showing here. If you think of the alveolar region of the lung, which is where the good air comes in and the bad air comes out, it really, in these premature babies, when they're born, does not develop normally. So as I walk about this stage with my height and everything else, I have roughly 500 million alveoli in my lung, and I have a total surface area of 140 square meters, in other words, a tennis court. So as I'm talking to you, I have this much surface area that is exchanging gases going back and forth. So what happens to these very premature babies who get born at 24, 25, 26 weeks gestation is that they stop developing, if you will, their tennis court. So they end up 
at this age with roughly half of the total surface area for gas exchange. Fortunately, with better approaches in the neonatal intensive care unit, they don't get airway disease anymore or anything of substance. But essentially, that's where you're at. Well, why is this significant? Well, you don't like to lose half of it, but if you look at the normal aging of the lung, so this is normal subjects, and this is actually from the famous Framingham cohort. And on the x-axis, you can see the age. And what you'll see here, this is males and females, but essentially, if you look at when you're in your 20s, you're at your peak of lung function. If you do not smoke, you're a non-smoker. That's your sort of progress over age, as we all age. If you smoke, you accelerate it, and you have a certain decline. But still, you can see that even at the great age of 85, you, if you haven't been... A, you know, doing other bad things, you're at 50%. It ain't great, but you're still getting along. Well, what happens is if you're a bronchopulmonary dysplasia patient and you start off with only half of your total amount of alveoli, and if your aging is at the same rate, and some could argue it actually would happen more quickly because of your background, you're going to run out of lung much earlier than coming on. So this is sort of where we're looking at, although now our graduates from the neonatal intensive care unit that we look after still on oxygen, we don't hear much in their lungs because they don't have much uh, airway damage. This is sort of the long-term scenario and why it is so imperative that we find better ways of allowing the lung to continue to grow and develop outside of the womb when born prematurely at 24, 25 weeks. Tomorrow you'll hear some talks about an artificial placenta and other perhaps exciting things that are happening, but Although we're doing so much better with these babies this day, we still have a long way to go. So what about the incidents and mechanisms? Well, this is actually some old slide, some data from the Canadian Neonatal Network. It's across Canada. And what you'll see is in, uh, in red, tremendous advances have been made in survival. You can see that as you go down the gestational ages, that there is a high survival rate, and it's only when you're extraordinarily premature that you have a significant mortality rate. The other thing is the occurrence of bronchopulmonary dysplasia with back even in 2003 had virtually wiped out the amount of um, BPD in the older gestational ages. But as you go more immature, you'll see here that, I'm sorry, this is where Northway's BPD, the one that he described back here was in this gestational age. However, when you go back earlier, there's this, quote, new BPD, a new type of BPD. Without the airway damage, the one that's characterized by failure of alveolar septa, and it occurs at really a 50% or more rate as you're going back. The sad thing is that over the last probably decade and a half, we have not touched this incidence at all. I've shown you Canadian data, but I could show you California-wide data from the CPQCC, which is exactly the same rate, the incidence, the rates. We have not had any meaningful improvement in the survival. And perhaps that means that we need to find out some new things. There's been lots of experiments. I won't go into them, but basically looking at mechanisms of BPD and models of BPD, primate models of BPD, patients with BPD. And essentially, they've generated what I call a laundry list of a potential causes. Each one of these has got some strong evidence supporting them, some against, but basically anything from the vascular hypothesis, which is one of the most popular ones now, that you no longer develop your alveolar capillaries and then the alveoli don't follow. But there's a data altering, me, there's data supporting all of these other types of pathogenesis. So we're not sure where it's at, and so are all these experiments wrong? Are they all right? Is there some combination, some right, some wrong? Well, what's really interesting about this whole scenario is that if you look at these patients, and we've heard, well, Dr. Sylvester was saying, he had 10 babies in the NICU, and a couple of them develop a neck, and the other ones don't. Well, I have a similar observation ever since I was a pulmonary fellow that I would go through any NICU, and shown here, where you can take two apparently similar-looking premature infants. You can put them in the same neonatal intensive care unit. This happens to be ours here at Packard. You can have them cared for by the same neonatologist, Dr. Stevenson, who is a superb neonatologist still practicing. But yet, one of them will develop BPD, and one of them won't develop BPD. Same unit, same care, same nurses, same docs. 
So, hmm, what is this? Then along comes a paper that I read and I said, this is nonsense. But then when a second one came along that was compatible, I had to pay attention to it. And it's really in relationship to genetic, or in other words, inherited factors, which may contribute to the development of either moderate or severe new bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And basically, these were twin studies where you take monozygotic, in other words, should have identical genome, and dizygotic, in other words, non-identical twins, This is the original one from Bandari. And then also there was a study done up in uh, Vancouver which was able to better define the, the monozygotic and dizygotic, but they got relatively s the same answer. And the conclusion was that really heritability, or in other words, genetic factors, was responsible for 50% to 80% of the risk to develop BPD. Astounding. Because really when we talk about adult diseases, Internists get all excited about cancer and psychiatric disorders. Yeah, they've got a fair amount of heritability, but it pales in comparison to BPD. So, wow, this was why I ignored the first study and the second, because I couldn't really believe it myself. So then, actually, I'm just going to go back for a second. One, one, of my, one of my jobs as a chair, you always have to see the good things and bad things. So you remember there was this little detail of a great recession that happened in 2008. Well, the good thing about that was the fact that uh, the administration allocated ERA funds, these Act for Recovery and Reinvestment. And so we were able to get the largest, uh, by assembling a team of investigators here, we were able to get the largest ERA grant to the School of Medicine to study this exact problem. What is the generic, genetic predisposition to this? Because we had this wonderful state who had created this whole blood spot database, and we could ultimately link individual DNA from babies with the clinical outcome through our databases, and we could then find it. So we did what was, at that time, the state-of-the-art uh, approach, and that was called the Genome-Wide Association Study, where basically we were trying to find bad guy genes, and in some ways it's like trying to find a criminal in the United States, and you can only look at the postal codes sort of as a way genetically where you can say, well, okay, I know that the bad guys living at 94305 happens to be in Menlo Park, but it doesn't tell you which one of the guys that live in Menlo Park is doing. This is sort of the fundamental aspect of a, of a GWAS. So we did this GWAS, and we looked at it, and on the x-axis are the chromosomes. On the y-axis is a statistical number. It doesn't matter what that is. It's called a Manhattan plot because it's supposed to look like Manhattan. And then you have to sort of get uh, certain postal codes, or in other words, we call them SNPs, that go above a certain statistical test called Bonferroni. As you can see, it wasn't really horseshoes or grenades. Close didn't count. We didn't make it. And so we really had no positive response, and we were wondering, well, why is this? We were very very disappointed in this. We also looked at something called copy number variants. We couldn't find any changes in that. And so this ended up, man, was I bummed. Were we all bummed? Not only had we invested multiple years on this, we had spent <coughs> lots of NIH money, and we came up with a big fat zero. So we redid and redid and redid the data, trying to figure out what had we done wrong. And then what happened? We questioned, the, this is my question, did we design the study correctly? Well, maybe those two previous studies, even though they agree with them, maybe they're totally incorrect. Are there scientific errors that we're doing, like drawing where the Bonferroni is? Then all of a sudden, oh, by the way, the other thing was that the NICHD had run a network, which actually was, I guess, in some ways relieving, although they, again, did not find any of these SNPs achieving, but at least it supported our findings, that we had not probably done something wrong. There was some limitation. And then all of a sudden, remember this guy. So this is Charles Darwin. And evolutionary tree, poor tree. And really, what it is, is to remember the GWAS studies, our genome-wide association studies, rely on what's called the common gene Common, pardon me, common variant, common disease analogy. You have to have something that's commonly in your genome to do this. And really what it does is it takes many, many, many 
thousands of years to have evolution take place, usually. So basically, if you look at U.S. infant mortality, the rates have dropped more than 90% in the 20th century. So this is mortality rate. So basically, you can see that in these premature babies never used to survive. It's only in the last one or two decades that they survived. And so this is why, and this is from a paper where the quote is at the top, because of rapid population growth and weak purifying selection, okay, this is not related to prematures, it says human pop, oops, what's happening here? Human populations abundance, have a, an abundance of rare variants, many of which are deleterious and have relevance to underlying disease. So this is the title of this slide, is rare single nucleotide variations are very common in an individual human's genome. When you hear rare, you think it is, you know, well, that's not very important. Well, rare just means that it happens to be in some one person. I have my own personal set of rare variants. Dr. Darmstead has very few of them. Dr. Buddha has very few of them. They have their own personal set of very rare variants. And so, we asked the hypothesis is that can these rare variants actually play a role in the heritability of BPD? Because we were looking at common. Well, the approach we did was to detect rare variants in pa Oop, I'm not sure. I guess there's two buttons here. My apologies. I'm using my pointer. Uh, detect rare variants present in patient but absent in the thousand genome data set, allegedly normal people. And we would exclude genes that are found in both BPD and non BPD patients looking for something that's different. And the results were that we found 182 overlapping genes in our non-BPD patients. And we had 258 non-overlapping in the non, pardon me, the moderate to severe. And if you look at them, and this is just some details for if there's any geneticists in the audience, but I won't go through it. But basically, we were very excited by this data. And I have to have a special call out to uh, Dr. Lee and Dr. Yu, who were really the, the leaders in uh, Dr. Snyder's lab of the analysis component of the genome as opposed to the clinical and translational. So we were very excited by that. And then what they did was they did, if you will, pathway analysis, where they were able to look at where these variants in the genetic structure of these individual children had in different pathways. And what we've got here is linked up together. So for example, here, extracellular matrix. This is the stuff that's sort of between the endothelium and epithelium. This is just listing a whole bunch of the genes, like collagen genes, other ones down through here. And so this is one of the strongest associations. So if you think of any sort of pathway, if you have a little knock here, and a little knock here, and a little knock here, and a little knock here, because you've got rare variants in multiple pathways that make that pathway not work just quite the right way. It doesn't matter if you have the same genetic variant here as you, the next premature baby with BPD, but you've got your own personal rare variant, then that can make you susceptible. So this was really exciting, and the other reason was that the strongest uh, signal from this extracellular matrix has a lot of good experimental data. Remember I said the laundry list? If you look back in that laundry list, you're gonna, feel, you're gonna see a lot of these characters in there, whether it's elastin or collagen, et cetera. So we then went from being very depressed to being very happy in the fact that we believe, and we haven't totally proven it, obviously, but that the heritability studies are indeed correct, these two twin studies, but the fact that it could be explained by these rare variants. Everybody's got their personal one. The second point was that it's really pathways that are probably more predisposing. So if you try to hone in on one single molecule in one single pathway, you're probably going to end up where you're at. So you have to look at these pathways. The other thing which I don't have time to talk to you about today, but we always talk about bad guy genes. Maybe there's good guy genes. So maybe it's not the rare variants in these pathways that predispose you to developing bronchopulmonary dysplasia, but maybe there's some good guy variants in these pathways that protect you. In other words, I can tolerate more oxygen. I can take going from 3% oxygen in utero to 21%. So there's lots of work to be done, and I think it's time to study these pathways under both ways. So in closing, I just wanted to congratulate, as I mentioned, the team. Um, this is a huge effort, and I'll just show you the, the list down here, and I'll let you read it in tall. Everything from 
epidemiologists, statist uh, statistical geneticists, geneticists, clinicians, translational to try to put this all together. And again, a real uh, special call out to Dr. Yu and Dr. Lee. And with that, I'll close and take uh, some questions. I think we've got an extra eight seconds over my five seconds. <laughs> five minutes. You did well, Hugh. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, and I'll just bridge back to Dr. Sylvester's talk where he was excited about looking at these blood spots that every baby gets tapped on. I mean, he was saying it's a couple of weeks later when the neck arrives, same thing with bronchopulmonary dysplasia. In fact, actually, the NIH has, uh, has, has sponsored several years ago, and I'm, uh, the results haven't come out yet, about whether newborn screening should include just whole genome screening and then being able to identify these different areas. So obviously, there's a lot of issues with that, pro and con and ethics and, and et cetera. But no, I think there's a lot of commonality that this is where uh, California has got a unique position where roughly 90% uh, plus of all neonatal intensive care unit babies are tracked through the CPQCC where you get collection of clinical, it's not billing data, it's actual clinical data. So I really see this as an exciting opportunity, but they are tied all together, whether it's, um, for example, the talk on retinopathy of prematurity, what's, what's very interesting about ROP and BPD, those two sounding similar names, is that in the lung, the current belief, not proven absolutely, but the belief is that it's a failure or an inadequate amount of blood vessel development. In contrast, you've got in the eye where there's too much vascular development. In fact, we did an epidemiological study, Susan Gage, who was a fellow that we all worked with here, that did this and did find a, 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 a relationship where the babies that had the worst BPD were protected against ROP. So I think there's a lot when we put the, ba the children together, their whole story, and then alone uh, all of the scientists, we can work together. Yeah, I was hoping you were going to mention that investigation, which I think is really provocative with respect to Similar kinds of problems, different outcomes for two different disease states. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions people have for Hugh? Yes? There's some I know and there's a lot I don't know, Dr. Buddha. <laughs> um, one thing is when we did the GWAS study, we, there's self-reported race ethnicity. And then, of course, there's in, informative ancestral markers. And what, what, when you look at that data, you can see that Yes, you can say you're of a certain race ethnicity, but if you really look at the dose of genes that you've got in there are, are quite different. I think it is very important. I'll just talk about the lung area, which I know the best. There was a lovely paper by Kumar et al. in New England Journal a few years ago where they looked at the African-American population, and it's well known to every po uh, pulmonologist that you've got to correct um, lung function w for race, ethnicity, and specific African Americans. And they were able to show that the uh, dose, if you will, of African genes versus the FEV1, the most important measurement that we follow as a pulmonologist, was directly related, but also was biologically significant in the FEV1. So I think it's an, a very important factor. The second important factor, example I'll give you from the lung literature, is accurately, if you're going to look at genetic predisposition, I think you have to do ancestral markers. So, for example, there's something called the, the Hispanic paradox in asthma. If you talk to uh, pulmonologists, pediatric pulmonologists on the East Coast, Hispanics have a tremendous amount of problem with asthma, just like African Americans do. If you look in the state of uh, California, we have very little. And, of course, if you look at the race ethnicity, it's significantly different between the Hispanics of the West Coast and the Hispanics of the East Coast. So I think those are two really powerful, important messages that, A, genes do play an important, critical role, and then we have to study them better. And probably the vulnerabilities, just as I said, some may be protective or non-protective. I think that some, dis we've always known, you know, Caucasians don't do very well with CFTR. We got a lot of it, whereas there's, uh, you know, other disorders. So I think genetics is really important. This is what happens when you start to talk to a pulmonologist about the lung. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much, Hugh. Thank you.